Today's reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 47. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this word that speaks of the birth of your church. And Lord, as we consider what it means for your church today, Lord, may your spirit guide us into truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Does the world feel secure? Does your life feel secure? It often feels like there are forces at work, partly because there are, that are hell bent on tearing our society apart. I don't know about you, but 
what I read, what I see, we are more fractured now than I can remember at any other moment in my life. Uh, you're either pro-science or you're an anti-vaxxer. You're either left wing or right wing. You're either conservative or progressive. You're either pro-LGBTQI or a bigot. You're either a climate change believer or a denier. You're either pro-Black Lives Matter or a racist. You're either a cat person or a dog person. Right? We try to put each other in these boxes. And it causes this rift. You know, truth is your perspective now, not, not the reality that is plain to see. Right? The media uh, praises the brave protesters in China at the moment, protesting lockdown. But let's rewind the clock about 12 months and people who were protesting the lockdown here in Australia. They weren't praised for being brave. They were ridiculed for being Conspiracy theorists. Right? Housing bubble, inflation, interest rates. Will the rain fall at the right time in the right amount? Uh, energy crisis, war, China's flexing her muscles. And then, of course, our personal lives. Uncertainty in relationships, in our health, in our work. And we all live with a level of uncertainty. We don't know what Monday is going to bring. We don't know. We have an idea what we might like it to bring. But we live with uncertainty. And in the midst of uncertainty, what do people often do? What do they do? Well, they look for a constant. We look for a constant to anchor our lives to. A relationship, a place to retreat to, a, a glass of red wine, uh, your favourite dinner. I can confidently say that spaghetti hasn't let me down yet. In the midst of all this uncertainty, where do you go to find true security? What or who is the ultimate constant in your life? Because the world that Peter's speaking into was just as uncertain as our world today. But the Roman Empire was reigning. The people of Israel were like, what's going to happen? And they wanted a secure world. We want a secure world where truth is plain, not obscured by a fog of lies. We want a world that brings people together, not tear them apart. A world where selfless love is the default, not selfish uh, or self-centered desire. And what we're going to see from Acts 2 today is that the world we want is exactly the world that Jesus secures. So three points are that Jesus secures a world that opens minds to the truth, that opens arms to one another, and opens hearts to one another. Now just a bit of background on Acts before we get stuck into uh, this chapter, just for a bit of context, traditionally known as Acts of the Apostles, uh, Acts 1.1 1, 1, uh, begins. We know that Luke uh, wrote Acts. You know, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, that's interesting. All that Jesus began to do and teach. Uh, teach. What's Luke inferring? Well, this book's about what Jesus is continuing to do and teach. So, Acts of the Apostles? Yeah, sure. Acts of Jesus. Perhaps that's better. Because it was Jesus, after all, who said to Peter, I will build my church. But I'm going to do it through you. So this, this book is about the account of how Jesus built his church through his disciples, empowered by his spirit. And Acts chapter 2 opens by telling us it's the day of Pentecost. This is the first day of what was known as the Feast of Weeks. It was a harvest festival and one of the major festivals during the year where Jews uh, were expected to come to Jerusalem and offer the first fruits of their crops. Well, there's a different kind of first fruits about to happen. It was a way of giving thanks to God, acknowledging that he is the God who provides. And, and it was a concrete expression of trust and it you know, accompanied all the regular sacrifices for sin. And so what do we find 
as they're trying to begin this celebration. Well, we've got Jews from lots of different nations coming to Jerusalem. Uh, and we've got devout Jews, uh, converts to the Jewish faith. So what, what the text is saying is we have Jews and Gentiles coming together. Uh, and it's a new beginning. The beginning of chapter 2 is an amazing scene. It's, it's this scene that really is, is the reversal of what we see back in the early chapters of the Bible at the Tower of Babel. There God came down to confuse the language and scatter the people. Here God comes down and they can understand in their own language what Peter is saying and the apostles are saying. And it doesn't scatter people, it brings them together. It's a complete reversal. Suddenly, people can understand. God is doing something new. And it's just as Jesus said, uh, that the Spirit would come and, and, and uh, lead the people into truth. In, in this chapter, what's happening is, is the world we all want, really, deep down, the world we all want, whether we, whether we acknowledge Jesus or not, the world we all want is breaking through right here. And so firstly, Jesus secures a world that opens minds to the truth. Jesus promised, John 14, 26, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Like the Spirit is going to remind people of Jesus' teaching. John 15, 26, he speaks about the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father and he will testify about me, says Jesus. John 16, 12, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Spirit's all about the truth. He will open minds to the truth of Jesus. Three key things that come through in this chapter. Who Jesus is, what he did, and why it matters. Remember that these disciples, they were running scared for their lives only a few short weeks before Pentecost. Peter, you know, before Jesus, he was, before Jesus went to the cross, he was all bravado and no bite. When Jesus told him that, Peter, I'm sorry, mate, but you're going to deny me three times. Peter's response was, no way, mate, I'm going to die with you. A few hours later, Peter's watching Jesus' trial and the rooster crows three times. Why? Well, he denied knowing Jesus three times. Now filled with the Spirit, Peter stands before a crowd of, of thousands some thought it was drunken babble. We're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. As Teresa said in our growth group, it's good to see they had those standards in the old days too. <laughs> right. It's only 9 a.m. Of course we haven't been drinking. What's happening right now is the fulfillment of what God promised through the prophet Joel. God is pouring out his spirit on people from all nations. And see what Peter proclaims through this chapter. Who Jesus is, what he did, and why it matters. It's the truth. Jesus, who is he? Verse 36, he is both Lord and Messiah. Jesus is Lord. Now this is incredible because what Peter has been saying up to that point, he's been speaking of the Lord. Do you pick up on that? He quotes the Old Testament Three key passages, he, uh, Joel 2, Psalm 16, and Psalm 110. And every time in those passages, when the Lord is spoken of, you go back to the Old Testament, it's Yahweh. And now at the end, he's saying, that's Jesus. He's God come in the flesh. Not only that, he is the Messiah, He's the promised king that God would send, the one that would sit upon David's throne forever. See, there were, there were these two great hopes in the Old Testament. One, that God would return to his people, and the other, that he would send his promised king to save his people. And Israel didn't realize that they were one and the same. And Peter's saying, they are. Now, what did Jesus do? Well, Peter goes on to explain he died on the cross and rose from the dead. And that was no accident, but by design. He says to them, you remember Jesus, that carpenter from Galilee who did amazing miracles that you crucified? <laughs> remember him? 
Well, here is what you don't know. It was always God's plan. All these Old Testament quotes, it's a way of Peter saying, see, what God promised, he's bringing to pass. He's keeping his promises. Jesus was handed over to you. Not because Judas betrayed him, not because the Jewish leaders conspired against him, not because Rome considered politically expedient to kill him, but because it was God's set purpose. Oh, and it gets better. God raised him from the dead. It was the stamp, that seal that goes, yep, he definitely is Lord and Messiah. Jesus is alive. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our hands. We talked with him. We ate with him. We saw him ascend to the right hand of the Father. He rose from the dead, and here's a key verse, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, why is that? Well, it's a way of saying because Jesus paid the debt of our sin in full. It's complete. He's paid the debt. So death had no hold on him. Why Jesus matters? Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So repent, believe, be baptized. And it's really astounding what Peter says. He says, do that in the name, not of Yahweh, but Jesus. Because Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. And what do you do that for? The forgiveness of sins. Not only did the Spirit of God open the disciples' minds to the truth that they preached, but the Spirit of God opened up the minds of those present so they could hear and understand the truth. The greatest miracle in Acts 2 is not that the disciples were able to speak in a way that people could understand in their native language. No, the greatest miracle in Acts 2 is verse 37. Have a look. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. A little bit further on, 3,000 hearts and minds were opened to the truth and came to faith in Jesus. This is what Jesus said the Spirit would do. that When he comes, he will convict people of their guilt. In regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Our hearts changed by God's spirit are hearts that will feel the sharp cut of the gospel as he opens our minds to the truth. The reality of who we are as sinners before a holy God. And only hearts changed by God's spirit are hearts that will leap for joy. When they come to understand what Jesus did for them on the cross. We want a world where the fog of lies is blown away and the truth is plain to see. And that's the world Jesus secures. The Spirit blows away the lies so we can see clearly who Jesus is. The one who is the truth. He blows away the fog of all the lies we tell ourselves so that we are all left, all we're left with is the truth of who we are, who Jesus is. And why we need to repent and believe in him. So what happens to a bunch of people that God pours out his spirit on so the fog of lies are blown away and minds are open to the truth of Jesus? Well, we get a glimpse of a world where people open their arms to one another. It's called the church. Verse uh, second point, Jesus secures a world that opens arms to one another. Now remember the crowd Peter's speaking to? People from all over the Roman world. Both Jews by birth and converts, so Gentile Jews if you like. They're coming together, but they stay together. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. See, Something astounding, I realized that these guys traveled to Jerusalem for this festival, but they didn't go home. They stayed. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it says a bit further on that they continued to meet in the temple. 
Right? The, the gospel brought these people together and it kept them together. All believers were together. Verse 44, verse 46, every day they continued to meet together. The Spirit breaks down walls and opens arms. The walls that the world wants to divide us by. This is Paul's point in Ephesians chapter 2, just after he's spoken, spoken about the amazing grace that we've been shown uh, through Jesus. He says how that grace effectively breaks down walls and brings the people of God together. He goes on to say that we are joined together to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And the gospel brings people together like nothing else in this world. We talk about wanting a multicultural society, although that word doesn't seem to be used as much these days, but that spirit is still there. There's only one truly multicultural society in the world. It's the church. We're bonded with something far more than our citizenship to a country. We're bonded together by the Spirit of God. That brings us together. That I can comfortably say that if it wasn't for the Spirit opening my eyes to the truth of the gospel, most of you here... I would not know, nor call you friends, nor call you brothers and sisters. What does that? It's the gospel. The world we all want is a world that brings people together and doesn't tear them apart. This is the world Jesus secures. And the church, she's meant to be a foretaste of that world. In a world that wants to box us into a tribe, a world that wants to tear us apart, the church should be a beacon of hope, pointing people to the world we all want. A world where we open our arms to one another. A world where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, says Paul. This brings us thirdly to the fact that Jesus secures a world that opens hearts to one another. Verse 42, it wasn't just that they met together and talked about the weather. No, they broke bread. They prayed. Verse 44, all believers were together and had held everything in common. They sold their possessions or their property to make sure no one went without. And verse 46, every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. The Spirit opened their hearts to one another. Sharing meals, opening their homes, praying, giving so that no one went without. They were loving one another. Isn't that the world we all want? A world marked by sacrificial, self-giving love? It's, it's no mistake that when Paul is encouraging the church in Ephesus after he's spoken about the gospel and how it breaks down walls and brings people together, that he then goes on to say, what, what should that community look like? Well, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, be humble, gentle, patient, forgiving. And I love this phrase, bear with one another in love. Because sometimes we need to bear with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Unity. Not uniformity. We're not all the same, of course not. But we're unified. We are brought together to open our arms and our hearts to each other. This is the world Jesus secures. Where selfless love is the default, not self-centered desire. And the church should be the beacon of hope that is pointing people to the world we all want. Church doesn't always get it right though, does she? It's tragic when she gets it terribly wrong. And that's why we, we also cling to the promise of what Jesus said, that he will return and he will right all wrongs. And the, the, the kind of broken shadow, uh, the broken uh, foretaste that the church is meant to be will finally be fully realized. And we'll get that world that we all want. Jesus secures the world we all want. By opening his arms and his heart to you and me. He does that on the cross. 
And, and when we just take the, the rest of our time together this morning, and, and, and we're going to focus on the cross because that's where I'm going with the talk, but also with the Lord's Supper, it, it's truly an incredible thing. When we think about the cross, the cross is the most recognised symbol in the world. Well, it's probably a combination of either that or the golden arches, but pretty sure the cross would win out. That's incredible, isn't it? Not only because of the impact, but because of what the cross actually is. It's an instrument of torture and execution. Uh, Glenn Scrivener, the Air We Breathe book that I've mentioned a few times, he says the cross has been revolutionised because the cross has revolutionised the way we see. Right, there's this image the, uh, of uh, an example of graffiti uh, from the ancient world, one of the earliest examples we have. Uh, now, I'm guessing no one here speaks, um, I think it's Latin that it's actually written in. So I'm going to translate it for you. Not that I speak it myself, but this is what I've told it says. Alexa Menos worships his God. Can you see the, 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 the scratching that, that is a picture of a man on a cross? Notice what his head is. He's a donkey. Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. No Roman would look at a cross and think to themselves, you know what, that would make a lovely charm on a necklace. <laughs> to them, it was utterly repugnant. Uh, the orator Cicero, who uh, was alive a couple hundred years before Jesus, he says this, Wretched is the loss of one's good name in the public courts, but the executioner, the veiling of heads, and the very word cross let them all be far removed from not only the bodies of Roman citizens, but even from their thoughts, their eyes, their ears. The mere mention of them is unworthy of a Roman citizen and a free man. Right? It was abhorrent to the ancient world. Crucifixion was extremely painful. It, the Romans had cooked, this, cooked up this idea that it was perhaps the most painful way you could execute someone ever. Because they died slowly, painfully, suffocating. We get our word excruciating from the word the cross. The Latin excrucius, which strictly translated means from the cross. It was also the worst humiliation. It wasn't just about the pain, the physical pain. It was the, the emotional humiliation. It was dehumanizing. You were naked. Before the world to watch, right? The shame and pain was name of the it was the name of the game, and the Romans they were the world champions. Crucifixion was their number one tool, but now the cross is exactly the opposite, and that's incredible. Even if you're not a Christian, right? you, when you see a red cross, you don't think, oh. That's a brutal form of execution. No, what do you think? You think life-giving blood. Care for the poor. You see a white cross on a wet red or green background, and what are you thinking? I need first aid. It's salvation. You see the cross on a church, and it should mean truth proclaimed here with open arms and open hearts. See, death by crucifixion was often a spectacle to be enjoyed by the masses. Life was cheap in the ancient world. Uh, there's an account of Caligula, a Roman, the Roman emperor, uh, who uh, came to power after uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, a little while after. Uh, uh, once ordered during a time when food was scarce, uh, that all prisoners be given to the starving animals that were used in the gladiatorial games as food. Whether they had been tried or not. And we gasp in horror at that kind of brutality. But to them, that's what nature teaches us. We often point back to Darwin as this, this founder of the idea of evolution. Well, actually, you can all go all the way back to Plato. Listen to what he says. Nature herself intimates that it is just for the better to have more than the worse, the more powerful than the weaker. Justice consists in the superior ruling over and having more than the inferior. 
Nature herself taught us that there were superior races. The Greek over the barbarian, a superior sex, men over women, a superior class, free men over slaves. And what did the cross of Jesus do? Leveled the playing field. You look to the cross and you are brought to your knees because you understand we're all in the same boat. Everyone's a sinner and we can only be saved by coming to Jesus and receiving the salvation that he offers. Being crucified in ancient Rome was being on the absolute rock bottom of the power hierarchy. You couldn't get any lower. But when we think about who was on the cross, doesn't that just blow your mind? That that's the way God decided to come and save us? Romans looking at the cross didn't see a God. They saw a donkey. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are not being saved. And Glenn Scrivener goes on to say, he says, Yet for Christians, something about it made sense. It made sense to their lives and their world. They felt themselves to have been met by the God of heaven who deigned to stoop that low. For them, rock bottom became ground zero. The cross was the epicenter of an earthquake. The, the reverberations shook every earthly certainty. Right? The highest had plumbed the lowest depths and began a radical movement to upend the world. How? Because this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Messiah. This is God on the cross for you. Do you get that? Jesus secures the world we all want by opening his arms and his heart to you and me on the cross. He had to come. This is the way God had planned it from the beginning. The cross, uh, our sin made the cross a necessity. But did God have to do it? Uh Uh-uh. He wanted to do it. Our sin makes the cross a necessity. God's love makes the cross a reality. That this was God's plan and desire to pour out his love on you and me. That is the anchor for our souls. That is the hope that we want. It's the constant we all need as we face the the uncertainties of what tomorrow may bring. That secure love of God. Jesus has secured for me and you a a secure world where his love for you and me will never change. Nothing can separate us from it. We cannot be snatched out of his hands. And you can know that certainty now. You can have a taste of that world now. The world we all want. And here's how. If you haven't done it yet. Repent and believe the good news. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Gracious, heavenly, almighty God, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for pouring out your spirit on all people. So that our eyes, our minds, our hearts can be open to the truth. So that we can see who we are before you, a holy God. Sinners in need of your grace. So that we can see Jesus, who is both Lord and Messiah, dying for our sins on on the cross. So that we can understand just how incredible it is that death could not keep its hold on him, but that he rose from the dead and secured for us. Life together with you forever. Lord, we thank you for this constant in our life. The constant of your love. Your unfailing love. Help us to cling to you as we face the uncertainties of life. Tomorrow, next week, the months and years that are ahead of us. Lord, thank you 
that Jesus has secured us. And he did that by dying for us. And we thank and praise you for this in his name. Amen.